Yeah. So what are the disadvantages of one? I'm mean, off to Clemson, and you're the only one. Uh, disadvantages. So we're going to go over a couple of different things uh, in this lecture. The first is kind of a short history of some of the basic stuff that kind of makes disadvantages make sense. Uh, what exactly is a disadvantage before we get into the structures, the functions, the meaning impact calculus, then we'll talk about a couple of the generic uh, disads and probably go home early because we can do that. So in the history of debate, there was really kind of like the before time. This is the great debaters era where we just got up and spoke all purdy like and I'm glad we don't do that anymore. So that really kind of made it hard for judges to figure out how to evaluate rounds sometimes. And so we created the stock issues debate, which was really a yes no question. Does the affirmative team meet the burdens of the stock issue? And so a lot of the time it was very much so yes or no, if you solve, yes or no, uh, if you have arms, yes or no, if you're inherent, things of that nature. And the problem with that is if you're right, then you automatically win. Like there's no way that the nay can be like, sure, that's true, but it's a bad idea. And so the first disad was born when someone said, hey, you know what, it's true that you do all those things, but it's probably bad that you do all of those things. And that's where we get into the net benefits and cost benefit analysis kind of frame of mind that we look at today. Whereas we look at disads as a reason why the affirmative team's idea is not uh, net beneficial. So what exactly is a disadvantage? A disadvantage is a reason why the affirmative team's plan is a bad idea. Uh, the app can also run disadvantages though. They're usually the counter plans and advance and alternatives. Uh, so don't just think of disadvantages as being a tool of exclusively of the negative. And this kind of brings us up to the cliff. So the cliff, this is a old school kind of idea and concept of how you understand disads. Uh, right, you're the affirmative team and you think that they, or the affirmative team is kind of this little guy up here with the ball and he's rolling a ball up the hill and the disad says that the ball is going to go over the hill and squash everyone on the bottom. So to kind of have that idea, we use three different parts of a disad. On the internal link, it's kind of like the ghost fourth area that we talk about. But really, it's an explanation of how the links lead to the impact. So it's just more links. And that will make a little bit more sense with uh, this picture, I think. So the link is how hard do you think the 1AC is pushing the ball over the cliff. They're the ones that put it right there. The uniqueness is how close to the edge of the cliff we are right now. And the impact is how big of a deal this is and why it's bad for it not. So for uniqueness. Uniqueness is an empirical argument, which means it's based off of fact. This is where we say this is how the status quo is, and this is what's happening right now. And you're always saying in that, uh, that the impacts are not happening. It's also where you explain why maybe, in some instances, why the impacts aren't happening and that the links uh, are really going to push it over. For a disad, the status quo is always good. If someone gets up and reads a disad that says the status quo is bad, they're reading their uniqueness in the wrong direction, which means they can't get offense from the disad. The status quo always says that things are well, because if things are good, there's no reason to change them. Which brings us to the link. The link is an advocacy claim. It predicts what the advocacy of the 1AC will cause. And you're going to generally say that it's going to cause something that the affirmative team didn't really think about. So it explains how the affirmative team functions from a different standpoint. So how the affirmative team changes the status quo from good to bad. And we'll have some examples at the end that kind of talk about that. The impacts, however, are normative claims. They make a distinction of good or bad. Either you prevent something good from happening or you cause something bad to happen. And both of those would be acceptable impacts. Uh, they also need to be terminalized. Uh, for most people, this means that you have to uh, cause global nuclear annihilation through a nuclear war, uh, genocide and death, dehumanization with framework, things of that nature that explain why those are the most important arguments. So what are the functions of a disadvantage? So how do you use them and how do they work in with other arguments? 
So using a disad, disads are reasons why the affirmative team is a bad idea, obviously. And you will weigh them against the affirmative team's advantages using impact calculus and at the end of the round after you are extending all your arguments and explaining how they function. So how do DAs work with other arguments? With counter plans, uh, they're the net benefit. They explain to you why your plan is a better, or they explain to the judge why the counter plan is a better idea than the affirmative team's plan. You're saying, look, there's a disadvantage that says the affirmative team's plan in the way that they do it is a bad idea. So let's also do it this other way. So there's always some overlap with, well, there's not always an overlap, but when you have a counter plan, it's usually your net benefit. With other disadvantages, uh, you'll end up collapsing out of disadvantages down to one, hopefully, uh, and maybe some case arguments if that's the strategy you're going for. But if you read two disads in the one in C or the yellow C, you should be collapsing down to one by the time you get to the yellow bar. And the point of that is to make the debate more specific it's so that you can spend more time on issues that you feel are important. And it's also just to keep you from stretching yourself too thin. With theoretical arguments, they also allow for you to kind of lead to a collapse. But disads in theory are oftentimes really good to have together. Um, I think that collapsing to theory in the block is always fun, but not always for the judge, sorry. Uh, but with other arguments, like you're going to be using uh, your disad just like you would use theory as another argument. So to get into kind of comparing impacts, we look at that through time frame, magnitude, and probability. And there's further lectures on impact calculus at this uh, co-op, I hope. If they're not, Tim will add those. But with our cliff, we can kind of look at some things about magnitude, probability, and uh, time frame. Probability is how likely it is for that to happen. So when the 1AC is making arguments, you're going to be seeing that probability is how likely it is for it to push that link over. Magnitude is how bad the impact is. Like how big of an issue is this going to be for other people? And time frame is how long it takes. So the time frame, how long it takes for it to happen. This is usually based on links and internal link stories. So when you make arguments against the links, you're going to be saying, uh, that that also hampers the time frame. Maybe sometimes you'll just say, hey, look, this is going to take a really long time for us to die from global warming, but nuclear war happens tomorrow. Magnitude again is how many people will die, generally. Uh, you can also talk about from more critical standpoints, which is how many people will be affected by the problem of the 1AC that they cause. And this is uh, always based off of the impact level. Probability, wait, where is that? Oh, I know that one. All right, so likelihood that disadvantage will occur. It's based on your link arguments. And so here's some disadvantages that you can kind of run. Uh, some generic ones that you'll see a lot are politics and elections. Uh, politics is an argument that says a bill is going to pass now. Your plan says that bill is not going to pass anymore. Or after we pass your plan, it's going to affect that bill from passing. And then that's bad because that bill was actually a really good idea. So a lot of the time that's coupled with counter plans or whatnot. Because counter plans you'll make arguments like the courts don't cause Congress to backlash. Or maybe if it's a more a less progressive policy and Obama's doing through an executive action, maybe that won't trigger the uh, links to the dissad. For elections, this is where we get into a lot of control of the Senate kind of arguments, because right now uh, the House is already being controlled by the GOP. So you'll see a lot of arguments about people saying that you're not going to pass legislation because the House is already gone from Democrat control, so Obama can't get his agenda done. And it's like this is a key time for certain policies to be passed so that Democrats can make up ground in the House. Maybe you'll hear like the Senate is the most important thing ever and your plan makes it impossible for the uh, Democrats to control the Senate, and so your plan is going to cause all these bad things to happen. Global really? Warming. Hmm? Global warming is whatever it surprises you. Think. Yeah, that really doesn't surprise me. I mean, I don't really think that politics right now is probably the best argument you can go for, but when we get closer to the election season, we'll see a lot more. If you go through the month of September and 
in the month of October without hearing an elections disad, uh, man, you are like the luckiest person I've ever met. <laughs> so if there's an election that year and you don't hear it, someone is doing something wrong, or that election is seriously lopsided. So there's that. Uh, coming into relations and sphere of influence arguments. Uh, these are when we have uh, policies that affect the foreign policy realm. They can affect our relations with other countries. We kind of already had a bit of a Russia topic, I think, already at this tournament. And so, like, you'll definitely talk about relations from there. And sphere of influence, a lot of the time, this is like China is doing really good things in Africa. Your plan sends America into Africa, and that upsets China because we're encroaching on the sphere of influence. So they backlash by doing something. Um, hegemony is always like a good one for a militarism topic. You're going to be saying, look, hedge is high in the quo, you're somehow hurting hedge and that's bad. Lots of different reasons why we need to have hegemony. For those of you listening at home, I know that's funny to hear me say, but you know, hedge is probably good too. Uh, spending and business confidence are two that you're going to hear a lot, especially at like the lower levels, you'll hear a lot of spending just ads. The economy is good, your plan hurts the economy because you spend too much money and that causes bad things. There's a lot of reasons why that could be. It could be investor confidence, like China said, starts freaking out. And we heard this a lot a while ago when we were kind of getting bailed out. And I haven't heard as much spending. There's a lot of good business confidence and consumer confidence arguments out there I've been hearing the last year. And so that's been really exciting. Uh, environment is usually a generic one that you'll hear a lot. And if there's a courts topic, you'll usually hear something about how this is going to clog up the courts so we can't get important things done. Uh, so those are kind of more generic. Some specific ones that uh, I've heard the co-op so far has been like proliferation. We had the nuclear triad topic. So if we want to have horizontal or vertical proliferation, yes or no, on how that's an implication. To say that right now, the nuclear triad is really good. You take away one of the legs of that, which makes it harder for us to have second strike capabilities or even just a forward leaning posture for our nuclear arsenal. Uh, Israeli backlash, they don't want us to take away their money. They freak out and see they lost US support because we're conditioning aid for the first time in a while. Blah, 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 blah. That's probably questionably bad or good. I don't know. Definitely impact turn to be had there. And then border security, um, definitely something we would have heard about right now. So uh, disadvantages when you come up with them in prep are usually not going to be as warranted and detailed as they potentially could be in a uh, section or when you have the time to write them at home. So like this ads are your bread and butter of debate. They really are where you come from. And so I have uh, some of the files that Perini put up on uh, the Google Doc that he has. We're going to go ahead and pull that up real quick. Or not the Google Doc, the Dropbox. This is a free plug for the Dropbox initiative. They're trying to uh, find a way to put some files up for people who may not have files at home. So Chris Perini is uh, distributing those via Dropbox file. So we're going to go in here and pull up some sample this ad. Oh, yay, politics. Excuse me. That was sarcasm, yes. No, just kidding. I love this. All right, so a while ago, we were having a lot of debates about the Keystone XL line and if that was going to happen or not. So from here, this is the Keystone XL pipeline is probably a bad idea to just add. So the uniqueness is Keystone won't pass in the status quo, that Obama rejected the contract proposal on January 18th, and that Congress set a 60-day window for a decision on the pipeline, and Obama has rejected based on a potential damage to the Ogala, Ogala aquifier. Uh, the uniqueness number two, is that Keystone can still happen now. Uh, TransCanada can repropose the contract with a route they think will be acceptable, and that TransCanada is considering its options between re-proposing with the US or proposing a contract with China right now. 
the link, there's a lot of different links that you could read depending on what they've said. Winners lose, winners win, uh, political backlash. A lot of the times you'll have to really listen to the one AC, and I know that's a novel concept is to listen to the other team, uh, but you have to un figure out what it is that they're doing that will make this harder. Uh, political capital is a lot of the time where you'll kind of hear this. So if Obama makes the plan pass, it means that he cannot prevent the Keystone XL from being going through because of one of these different areas. So the internal links, while TransCanada estimates that the Keystone XL will have 11 significant spills, more than 50 barrels of crude oil over 50 years, a more realistic assessment is 91 spills over the pipeline's operational lifetime. Uh, TransCanada arbitrarily and improperly adjusted spill factors to produce an estimate of one major spill on the 1,673 mile uh, pipeline that they have about every five years. But federal data on the actual incidence of spills on comparable pipelines indicates a more likely average of almost two major spills per year. The existing Keystone 1 pipeline had one major spill and 11 smaller spills in its first year of operation. Uh, CEA's analysis of the time needed to shut down the pipeline shows a response to a leak at a river crossing could conservatively take more than 10 times longer than the 11 minute and 30 seconds that TransCanada assumes. Uh, after the June 2010 spill, over 800,000 gallons of crude oil into a uh, tributary of the Kalamazoo River and Enbridge uh, Tar Sands Pipeline, a 38-inch pipe compared to the 36-inch pipe that the Keystone XL was, which was not completely shut down for over 12 hours. Uh, the DS Trans Canada failed to take into account that tar sands pipelines are operated at higher temperatures and pressures and that uh, bitumen is more uh, acidic than the conventional crude, more corrosive and more abrasive agents in it, meaning the pipeline will suffer wear and tear at a significantly increased rate. Yet the supplemental draft EIS expects one incident uh, due to corrosion every 3,400 years. E, another factor that led to TransCanada's spill, low spill estimate is that they relied on technological improvements to help protect the Keystone XL pipeline. However, there are only calculated enhancement, enhanced computer monitoring technology, not enhanced pipeline construction, which will only alert the company to a leak, not to help to prevent. F TransCanada has admitted that their oversight of the pipeline is going to be scarce. They'll have very few foot patrols. Most monitoring will be done by bi-weekly flyovers. And neither will be able to identify an underground leak if it occurs. Uh, G, their proposed computer system would not be able to identify pinhole leaks, which could potentially lead to thousands of gallons of oil escaping from the pipeline. Uh, for months before the company notices, TransCanada's own documents at this detailed at Stansbury shows that the company acknowledges the pinhole leaks could take as long as 90 days to detect. And so that's all of the uniqueness and links so far. So let's kind of go back and look at the uniqueness for a second. That's really telling us that the Keystone will not pass now. It's an empirical statement. It's saying why it's not going to happen. The other team can definitely have empirical statements that say why it can happen, but that's how you kind of, you know, decide via clashes, right? On the link level and the internal links, we see that this is more of a story that we're seeing now. And you'll hear a lot of like the older coaches, the old guards, so to speak, talk about how debate is all a storytelling mechanism, and that's always about telling the story. Now you hear like more people kind of repeating that these days. But it really is a question of how close of a story can you tell? And if you have a question of like, am I being too detailed or am I not detailed enough? Some good ways to kind of practice that is to tell your friends stories more often. Like we do that anyway, right? But stories only make sense if you have all the parts and components into it. So understanding some of the components of good storytelling is exactly what you have to do in debate. And having that story that you tell makes it easier for other people to kind of understand where it is that you're coming from. This leads us, of course, to the impacts. 
the Galanga Aquifier. The worst case scenario site for such a spill is the Sand Hills region of Nebraska. These sand hills are ancient sand dunes that have been stabilized by grasses because of their very permeable geology. Nearly 100% of the annual rainfall that infiltrates this very shallow aquifer. Often less than 20 feet below the surface, aquifer is well known. It is one of the most uh, productive, important aquifers in the world. The B is realistic calculations, you know, worst case scenario. Uh, spill estimate would be more than 180,000 barrels or 7.9 million gallons. Just think if that was milk, how big that would be. In the Nebraska sand hills above the aquifer. Two is river spills, contaminants from a release of the Missouri Yellowstone River would affect the entire Sacaglia. Yeah, yeah, good enough for me. In North Dakota, where they would adversely affect drinking water intakes, aquatic wildlife, and recreation. Contaminants from a spill at the Plate River crossing would travel downstream into the Missouri River for several hundred miles, affecting uh, drinking water for intakes for hundreds of thousands of people as well as aquatic habitats. B is realistic calculations yield for case uh, estimates of more than 160,000 barrels of crude into the Yellowstone River crossing, more than 140 into the Plate River, and more than 120,000 into the Missouri River. Uh, I'm not going to read the Dan Boreal because I'm lazy. And like those are the kinds of things you would talk about and you would impact them out a little bit further to explain why that kind of environmental degradation is bad. Destroying the environment for oil's sake has a lot of really important reasons why that's bad. There's a lot of reasons why poisoning people with oil water is bad. I think in the last couple of months we've heard a lot about oil spills in rivers in Virginia and throughout the country that we can see the effects of these are long lasting where people are still drinking bottled water and showering with bottled water because they're afraid of the shit that's in their water. Like, these are problems. And so disads are kind of the bread and butter of debate. Like, this is where you cut your teeth. This is usually the first argument that you learn. But it's also kind of the first steps to understanding more advanced structure. Like, we talk about criticisms as these crazy out there ideas, but critiques are merely referred to as non-unique disads for a reason. Like, there are links, there's impacts, and then there's an alternative that sounds a lot like a counterpoint. So like, it is just another piece of the puzzle, and as soon as you look at other arguments through that lens, it's important. Uh, remember that disads should always be offensive. I don't mean like you have to offend people with them, but they should be reasons why you win the round you'll see a lot of people making really basic disads and the impact is you don't solve very well. Well, that's a case argument then, and that should be on the case. So if you, the, if you have a bunch of disads and you're like, oh, their impact is the same as our disad, what should I do with my disad? Should I read all of the same things? No, you could very easily use one of the disads you prep during your preparation time as it turns to their advantage and sometimes that makes the debate a lot cleaner. So just because you have disadvantages written down doesn't mean you have to read them. Uh, understanding that you have to be more extemporaneous, which is something that we tend to get further away from topic area tournaments where we've done so much research we don't want it to go to waste. But be more strategic with your use of disadvantages, which was more kind of the theory arguments with disads. If you're afraid that they're not gonna be substantial then you run topicality with your disad so that you can prove the links to your disad. And so when they no link your disad, that's the proof on topicality. When they say, oh, we meet your topicality, then they're pretty much agreeing that in some way, shape, or form, they're gonna link to your disad. They might decide to link term you, but as soon as they say no link, they're articulating abuse in the round for you to win on theory. It's a lot easier just to say, sure will bite your disad and then say why your disad's a bad idea. So, that's something to remember as you go through them. So I need to see that. I forgot I had the screen up. Um, any questions from our one audience member? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so what do, you, what do you do if your disad's turned on you? So like, your disad's hegemony's bad, but then the affirmative says hegemony is good. Here's all these examples of hegemony being good historically. Cool. First of all, they're obviously wrong. So, 
So I do just want to explain to them why that is. And usually this is going to happen on the without hedge, then this would happen is a more important thing than it. with hedge, like these other things will happen. And that's where like the debate, you're really going to get into that impact calculus realm. You're going to be trying to answer that argument like, oh, hedge, if you say hedge is good because we want to prevent a multipolar collapse, or a unipolar collapse leads to a multipolar cluster where like everyone's fighting over that, creates power vacuum. And then they get up and say hegemony is bad because it causes terrorism. You can make arguments that say, well, when there's a new hedge, guess what? They're going to attack that hedge too. And so like terrorism is going to continue to occur. It may not happen to us, but it will happen to whoever follows us. But before we ever get to that point, we're more likely to have that collapse scenario, which means we're going to win the time frame debate. So like, you have to make those kinds of arguments. Also, what's more probable? Like we've had plenty of collapses that happened through hegemony that really did reinstate a new world order. And all of those pretty much happened before the invention of the nuclear bomb. And those were bloody enough on their own. Today, you can definitely make like try or die arguments as to how uh, when we're in chaos that nuclear weapons tend to not get looked at so closely and they disappear and get used. It's like your terrorism scenario only happens because we're in a multipolar down spiral. So like you want to control the internals to their arguments and explain how your the new phrase is a prior question. Okay. Gotcha. So, like, since I'm new to debate, um, should I just, like, stick with some generic this ads, or would it help to try to specify them? You should do both. So, that's actually a really good question, by the way, but always, it's always easier to learn generic this ads because you can always run them. You should always have them memorized uh, as often as you can, or enough of them, too. And the way you don't memorize, like, five at once, memorize one at a time, because okay. our memories work that way a little bit better. Um, if you find your memory works differently, by all means, go ahead and learn five at a time. But mastering one thing at a time usually is better. And mastering that one dissad and having it in your pocket means that if you get blindsided by something that you didn't really think about, then you have a generic argument to fall back on so you don't look silly or you don't look like you don't have anything to say. This is really important because during prep, you're always trying to get more specific dissads than more generic ones. Are there times where you run your generic politics dissad? For sure. It's called every time you're on NAG and they run a plan. Like, there's no reason not to run your politics dissad because by the time you take that to a tournament, you should have debated that in practice so many times that you know the generic responses that they're gonna come up with. And so you can create specific responses to those to explain why you're still right. And that's where generics are really good because you have familiarity with them. Uh, at the NDT, I was talking to some people and they were saying that like when you break a new app that confuses your opponent or like kind of throws them off guard, a lot of the time they'll de like the will default to a generic strategy that they know really well and they'll wax you on that while you don't know that app very well because you were trying to be sneaky. So there's times when generics are more powerful than specifics. But at times there's also a lot of good reasons why those specific arguments can be better than generics. And so that depends not only on the debater yourself, but it depends on your opponents, it may depend on the judge, and what's the best strategy going in for that particular resolution. Okay. Yeah, All right, that, yeah well, well put. So yeah, last question. Uh, so you mentioned that there's disads for the affirmative. Are, th are those really any different than the disads for the opposition? Uh, nope, they're going to say the same, generally the same thing, except the uniqueness might be a little bit different. Well, no, the uniqueness will probably be, it makes it a lot harder, because you're going to get up and you're going to say the states are banked. If they run like a 50 states counter plan, which is pretty much the first counter plan I think was ever written was why have the federal government do it when the 50 states can do it? And then the dissat is federalism. And like I definitely left that off the generic list because I figured that's in the counterpoint lectures. But 
when they get up and say we need to like have more states' rights, and so we're going to let the states do the plan, and the plan is to increase education spending by like 100 million per state kind of thing. Then you say a point of uniqueness: states are teetering on bankruptcy. B is the link. You make them spend 100 million dollars that they don't have. States aren't allowed to go into the red theoretically, so like that's really bad for their economy and for their ability to loan and garner credit, which means that it's going to affect their ability to have a balanced budget and blah, 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 blah. And the impact of that is that the state's economies will collapse. California is amongst these that is really in trouble and that if you make them spend another hundred million that they don't have on education, then that could cause all these bad things from the California fallout. The seventh largest economy in the world, if you collapse that, it's obvious that America collapses, but also all the other countries. Okay. And so I wouldn't spend as much time, like you don't want to spend two minutes on a just add to a counter plan. Uh, I saw Sarah Kennedy used to spend like 30 seconds when she would do it. And it would be this tight little just add that was like one liners for the tags, two warrants, and move on. And so she was really good at doing that. Okay. Yeah, because like, yeah, during the constructives, like the. The MG, that's the last time that they'll get to bring up new arguments. So if you spend so much time on on a, saying that their counter plan's bad, then you like waste time adding more arguments to, to your plan. Well, so think about the debate. So debate is always about choice. Like life's about choices is an old Matt Taylor joke. He was a dog at Long Beach for quite some time. And he always would say life's about choices. And debate is entirely about choices. Your disad to the plan creates a series of choices in the eyes of the MG that they have to take that they're able to take. So every argument that you make increases, should potentially increase the choices that you're able to make and decrease the choices that your opponents are able to make. What that means is that you're trying to box them into a corner where they have to say specific arguments. So as the MG, you really are trying to create the vast majority of arguments that your PMR can pick and choose and collapse to in the PMR. Okay. So, like having all your eggs in one basket in the MG really isn't the best of strategies, especially in like a world of the 50 states counter plan. It's very rare that you can't also perm the 50 states counter plan, run a disad to it, run a solvency deficit to it, and then kind of go answer the disad if you, I mean, you have to, but you yeah. probably don't want to. Okay. Well, you need to when you make that. You just don't want to talk about federalism because we're tired of it. Right. Okay, so so what you kind of mean is, like, with the choices thing, there's pretty much an opportunity cost to any arguments you bring up in a debate. Because like, yeah. you could say something else, but <laughs> you're not. Well, it's all, like... Yeah, man, debate is so about timing and understanding how much time you have left. You know, think of every debate as that two-minute clock during a football game. If you don't know very much about football, for those of you at home, uh, you have two minutes at the end of the game where they kind of stop time a little bit more often. You're usually running more plays during that. And you throw the ball a lot more because that stops the clock. That's about all I know about football. And how that relates to debate is that you really are trying to beat the clock as much as your opponents in the arguments that you're making while making only good arguments. And so figuring okay. out what those good and bad arguments are is, you know, that's the PMR's job is to extend those through when they make the change. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, this has been really helpful. Like, uh, I mean, I didn't really think about, like, the whole answering this ad is like part of this ads 101 but I guess that's something we could quickly talk about since you don't want to answer the uniqueness the link and the impact with offense do not turn all three so do not go from saying that the economy is bad to saying it's good to saying that 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 you help the economy is saying it hurts the economy and is saying that that's probably like a good thing to say it's a bad thing because that's just straight turning all three means you double turned yourself and now you've created another advantage for them. Like okay. when you're answering it, you don't want to say the exact opposite to all three. 
So usually you only answer the unique hits and links with offense or the impacts with offense. And like sometimes it's really hard when you're answering a this ad because they're right. Like I've been the MG when the LO got up and just spoke the truth. And I was like, wow. Yeah. There's no reason why we should ever do this app. This is the stupidest idea we could have ever come up with. Your next strategy is so perfect. I just want to crawl into a ball in the corner and die because I am embarrassed. And that happened to me a few times. And so we went all in on defense against the internal links and impacts of the dissat. And that was one of those times where like, people don't understand how defense and offense function off of each other in the round. So two minutes of nuclear war doesn't happen is not answered by extend our uniqueness and links. And that's basically what they did. So okay. understanding how all three of the categories, uniqueness, links, and impact, interact and how they compare to the other team. Because we got up during the impact calculus and the PMR, and one was just like, look, on a magnitude level, Matt spent two, spent two minutes on impact defense because they're winning the uniqueness and links. Yeah, we agree. But they don't, that doesn't do anything. There's no magnitude to their impact. There's no time frame to their impact. There's no probability to their impact. The only team that has magnitude, probability, and time frame on their side is us. So we win. And the judge is just in the back of the room nodding. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, really, you just got to focus on where, where you're winning at some point. Just cut your losses. Like. Well, I'll, you got to figure out why you're winning and why you're not losing. Okay, and then and frame it to the judge. Yeah. yeah. Like, you're always trying to figure out, like, which argument that they can make right now says we lose. All right, how do we answer that? Okay. So much to take in, I like it. <laughs> which is why it's on tape, so you can listen to it later. And my beautiful voice. And that's probably it, because I'm out of stuff to say. Well, thank you. Yeah, I don't know why they had me do the dissad lecture. Let's just be honest about that. I haven't written a dissad in a year.